The one person in the whole world that I would like to spend all my time with. Really, and don't marry someone unless they're the one person in the whole world you want to spend all your time with. If you marry someone that's not that, you will gradually regret it. As the book of, <laughs> as the book of Proverbs says, that your marriage will become like a continuous dripping. And that's when a, a sink goes drip, drip, and you don't really hear it till you're trying to go to sleep. And at night, it's, you know, it's enough to drive you crazy. They call it Chinese water torture. That's what marriage is like. If you don't, marry the one that God chose for you and designed for you that, that exactly the book of Genesis, I'm not teaching Genesis, I'm teaching Revelation, but Genesis says that a wife God designs exactly corresponds. Every area of your strength helps her and every area of her strength helps you and together you can do something you could never do apart. It's very exciting. But that's not how most marriages are. You pick the prettiest or the strongest or the flashiest or the richest or the loudest or whatever, not the most godly. So I would encourage you, marriage is very important. And uh, I dated 741 different girls at our Christian college once, each one of them once because I didn't want to get married, because my parents fought every day I knew them. My parents fought, threw stuff at each other, swore at each other, it was terrible. So I didn't really want to get married. Who wants to have that? So I dated all those girls once, and then I met Bonnie, and I looked at her and I said, you are who I've prayed for my whole life, that I would meet you. And after I said that, I went, <laughs> oh. Because doesn't that sound like a pickup line? In America, you know, these boys have pickup lines and they say, you know, oh, you're the most wonderful, you know, and you know they're just saying that to try and get you. Well, when I said that to her, that you are who I've prayed for my whole life, I thought, you know, that she wouldn't believe me, but she did. And uh, so let's begin. And I know I've already spent some time. We're, we're looking at Revelation 1 to 5 this week, 6 to 22 next week. One to five are what I believe is the most vital part of Revelation because it's Jesus talking directly to us. It's his church. Now I assume that all of you are born again Christians, right? Steve or uh, somebody has checked it out, right? And asked you your testimony, right? Have they asked you your testimony? You've written it out and explained it. So you're all Christians, right? Yes? Uh, and. Uh, and you all have the Holy Spirit, a Christian has the Holy Spirit living inside of them. Because of that, this section says, the Spirit is speaking to us. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Now all of you are part of the church, so am I. We are in this room, part of the church. So this is the most applicable part of Revelation that there is, it's fascinating. Now, if any of you are real computer-ish, um, and you like to, to have electronic copies. Bonnie and I travel, so we don't have very much paper with us because they weigh our suitcases, and paper builds up, and so does everything else. Uh, and so we try and be electronic. But on uh, Dropbox, and there's a, a, a little link for you, is both a PDF which of this. I mean, here, listen. Everybody be real quiet. Isn't that heavy? That's, that's one year of my life preparing that for you guys. I, I only type with two fingers. When I went to school, only girls took typing because they were going to be secretaries. Boys took Latin. I don't know why, but I took Latin. And I've spent the rest of my life typing with two fingers. So every one of those words and, and every book I've written are product of two fingers. And I just go like this. So, I've spent a lot of time for you guys, one whole year of two fingering to get all that down. But if you'd like an electronic copy, right there. Uh, also, there's a word copy where you can actually type, you know, the, the fill in the blanks are right there and you can type them right in. And that's what they do at the other Bible Institutes, you know, in New York and in Florida. 
they actually put this into the Logos Bible software and it's actually on your computer and all the verses are hyperlinked. But that's for you if you'd like it. Um, real quickly, Bonnie and I are full-time missionaries. We travel the world. These are the places where we serve. Uh, the corner right there is the Bible Institute in Hungary. Uh, we'll be there in a couple of weeks. Uh, we work in Central Europe with the refugees. We work with the Central Asian missions. We work in the Middle East with uh, uh, one recent conference we did was training evangelists who go into the refugee camps in the Middle East where all the displaced people from Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and every other and, and northern African countries are all in these refugee camps and they're actually evangelists who are born again Arabs who move into the refugee camp. Can you believe it? Move in. Some of them have a million people in them. And all they have, the, the United Nations makes these cement buildings that are like squares. And each, each family, you know, it's just a, a building, floors like this, of squares of cement. And it has a little door in the front, and on the back side it has little windows. There's no electricity, and there's no water. You walk however many floors down outside to the toilet, you walk however many floors down outside to get water. Uh, you cook your food. If it's inside, you cook it however you can cook it. And people live like that. Those are called refugees. And there are millions of them. You know how many people are displaced from Syria right now? I mean, unbelievable. And, and northern Africa with all that Gaddafi did and the fights that are going on and Sub-Sahara, uh, Africa, it's unbelievable. They live in these. And so we, through a seminary in Jordan, train Islamic evangelistic uh, church planters. They're actually church planting in refugee camps. They'll have a church meeting in one of these little squares in one of these buildings. It's, it's amazing. The Lord is doing great things. Uh, we also work in Sub-Sahara Africa, and that's my wonderful wife right there, the one with the big smile. And that's my email address, by the way. Uh, this is uh, our biography. Uh, I was saved at age six. Bonnie was saved at age 21. I was called to the ministry at age nine. Uh, when I went to Bible school, they said that you cannot teach the Bible until you've mastered the English, the Bible of your, your uh, heart language, which for me is English. And so, the professor was such a good teacher. I said, how do you know the Bible so well? He said, son. He was really old. Son. He said, until you've read the Bible through at least one for every year you are old, you'll never understand it. I said, really? I was 19. How many times do you think I'd read the Bible when I was 19? Only once. Do you know why? Someone paid me $100. If I'd read the Bible, they said, if you read the whole Bible through, I'll give you $100 for you to go to camp, you know, to Christian camp. What a deal. 100 bucks back then in the 70s? That was a deal. So I read the whole Bible, and that was it. And I was in Bible school. I was, in, I was preparing to be a pastor, and I'd only read the Bible once. The rest of the time, I just did this. You know how when you, you're not sure where to read, so you just open it up. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. And so that, that was my first week of Bible school. I was 19, 1975, a long time ago. Um, so I started reading the Bible. I read it through once a month for the next three years to catch up. I thought, I want to get ahead. You know, and by the time I was 21, I'd read the Bible 36 times. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting thing. Uh, I went to Michigan State University, Bob Jones University, the Master's Seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary. Bonnie and I pastored local churches for 40 years. Of course, I have this with raising him. Uh, everything I've ever taught is online. It's on YouTube. I can't believe it. Um, YouTube is a secular tool that God really uses. And one of the things that I've done the most is question, <clears throat> excuse me, question and answer um, sessions. And usually where I speak, they have uh, smart boards, you know, these computer, it's like a whiteboard, only it's a computer screen. And uh, I will spend the whole time 
uh, answering questions. And it started out back when I was in uh, Oklahoma. I would uh, go to the local colleges and talk to kids. That's what I call people your age, kids, because you look so young. You look like my children. Uh, and uh, it, it's just wonderful to see you serving the Lord at this age. But uh, someone started, um, someone actually took videos, like you are, of the answering question and answers and started posting them on YouTube. I mean, look at that. That was one of my first ones. It, why did God create the tree of good and evil if he knew that man was going to fall into sin? And a million people have watched that thing. I can't believe it. And, and on down the line, I mean, there are hundreds, a couple thousand of them, I think, on there. So um, well, what's really interesting is this is the framework I answer the questions from. Uh, my personal biblical framework is I, I believe that we're all called to be evangelists. That means that we share the gospel. People have to be saved. They don't just get saved going to church or being born into a Christian family. Uh, they're saved, I believe, the Bible teaches, by Christ alone. Not by being baptized, not by uh, somebody doing some ceremony to them, but them calling in the name of the Lord and the righteousness of Christ is imputed to them. Uh, by the way, that's 2 Corinthians 5.21, that wonderful doctrine, but I'm not teaching Romans this week. I'm an inerrantist. That means I believe that the scriptures are inspired. There is no book in the world like this book. This is actually God's breathed out truth. This is the only thing that can come inside you and actually fix your mind. There are a lot of people with messed up minds. And they take pills, and there's nothing wrong with taking, you know, lithium if you're bipolar or whatever. But all that does is stabilize you. Only the Bible changes, repairs the mind. Isn't that amazing? Only the Bible. And uh, it's tremendous. And so the scriptures are inspired. I'm a creationist because God said he made everything in six solar days. And the place where he says that most clearly is not in Genesis. It's in Exodus 20. In Exodus 20, in the Ten Commandments, if you remember the fourth commandment, the Sabbath day, do you remember how it goes? God's talking to the Jews who were slaves in Egypt, and he says, you shall labor six days and rest the what? The seventh. Because I created the universe in six days and rested what? The seventh. So did God create the universe in six ages? No. In six billion years? No. He said, as you work six sunups to sundowns, you do it because I created the whole universe in six what we call solar days. See, that's, there's no disputing that. All the people that don't believe in creation, they say, well, we're not sure in Genesis what day means but we're real sure what it means in Exodus, right? Because he was talking to slaves. And he says, just like you work six days and rest the seventh, I worked, created the universe in six days. So I'm a creationist. Also, the same God that presented that says there was a big catastrophe. Did any of you read, it went through the news this week, that they found the spot where almost every dinosaur was killed 66 million years ago on the same day. That's in the news. I looked it up in Google. Say, 66 million years ago, dinosaurs extinct. And what they said is, a meteorite hit down in Mexico, in the Yucatan. That's down you know, at the bottom of Mexico, between North America and South America, right there in the middle. A meteorite hit there, and it said it made a tsunami and it buried underwater all these dinosaurs. Now, what are they trying to explain? Noah's flood. And they said, it's amazing. All of these dinosaurs all died the same day. And they all got buried with water from the wave that came from the meteorite, the tsunami. Do you see science? is trying to figure out what happened on Earth. If they just read the Bible, they would know, right? It's amazing. Also, I'm a cessationist. In other words, that though the Holy Spirit is very much at work, one thing he certainly is not doing is inspiring more 
direct revelation from God. You say, why is that important? Have you ever had anybody say, the Lord told me this? I have people all the time come up to me, especially because of that YouTube channel. I mean, there are a lot of wackos out there. And they say, well, the Lord told me to tell you. And I write them back and I said, the Lord told you that. Is that equal with this? Is that scripture? Is that exactly the same as God's word? Because if it is, then you're, a, a, you're actually a mouthpiece for God. You are a, a prophet from God. And the Bible says if what you said doesn't come true, you should be killed. Did you know it says that in Deuteronomy? It says if someone claims to be God's prophet and prophesies something, and what they say does not happen, they are a false prophet and they should be killed. They go, oh, no, no. I'm not at that level. I'm just saying I feel like you, I say, okay, I'll accept that. But if you tell me you're talking at the same level as the Bible, you should be careful. So that's called cessationism, that God is no longer sending apostles and prophets that speak the very pure, inspired word of God. Uh, also, maximalist, this is not from Gladiator, you know, Maximus, Decimus, whatever his name was. A maximalist says that we believe that inspiration not only covers the spiritual stuff, but anything God says about history or science is absolutely true. Isn't that interesting? That they're digging right now. You guys just got back from Israel, didn't you? Did all of you go? Did you see the city of David? Did you go in any of the tunnels underneath and all that? They just found... Uh, Let's see, what's his name? Nathan Ben somebody. Joash, I mean Josiah, King Josiah's steward. They found his ring with his name on it that's right out of the Bible. I mean, they just found that and announced it this week. So probably they were looking at it while you were there. And they said, it's starting to change how people look at Jerusalem. Every time they dig in the city of David, everything that the Bible says happened there, they find. Whether it's a, a steward's signet or whether it's a street. Or like the pool of Bethesda. Did you go there? The pool of Bethesda with St. Anne's, you know, that. Did you sing inside the echoey thing? Oh, what fun. Did you know that was buried for 1,800 years? Nobody knew it was there until the French started digging and they found it. Did you see how far down it was? It was really deep. That's Christ level, way down there at the bottom and all that rubble's on top of it. So anything the Bible says about history and science is true. That's what a maximalist, see a minimalist is, they say, well the Bible's inspired when it has to do with faith and you know, stuff about God, but not about homosexuality, right? That God didn't really get that right. Not about, you know, uh, the, the nation Israel, or not about the role of men and women, not about the family. Those things are moral, and, and we're not sure he's right about that. But about spiritual things, he is. No, no. That's the minimal view, which Jesus didn't even hold. Jesus held that everything God said, he said every word of God is pure. Uh, also, a dispensationalist, which means Israel is not the church and God has separate plans, and we're going to look at all that. Uh, throughout this week, and at this rate, we'll never get through this week, so you guys have to listen faster, okay? And I'll talk faster. Am I talking too fast now? You guys are really good in English. No, I'm proud of you that you're here and doing this. It's amazing. But this is what I pray for you, personally. When I'm alone, Bonnie and I, when we're in the professor's apartment, going to bed at 7 o'clock because we're on a different time zone, waking up at 2 in the morning while you guys are all snoring. I could hear some of you snoring last night. Uh, we're up and praying for you, and this is what we pray. May God stir in you a deep and abiding love for Jesus Christ that can only be satisfied by time spent daily with him in the Word. That's how you know how healthy you are. If you have an internal hunger that's only satisfied by spending time alone with the Lord, and that's what we pray for you. Um, now let's go through all your assignments. Uh, first of all, uh, these 10 hours are in chapter one through five, and um, 
it's, it's really for you to see the connection, and that's my goal. And then the next hour to understand prophecy. Um, here are the assignments. Read the whole book of Revelation. Do you know how long that takes? One hour and 25 minutes. That's all it takes, okay? Uh, the way I know that is, you can look up on Google. I looked it up this morning. Um, how long does it take to read each book of the Bible? One hour and 25 minutes to read the book of Revelation. So there you go. So you have to spend an hour and 25 minutes to read the whole book. And on the test, it will say, did you read it, yes or no? So that's simple. There's a project. The project is half of your grade. And the project is doing a devotional on each chapter of the book of Revelation. Now you have it easy this week. How many chapters are we covering this week? But next week there are 17. So if you are smart, you will just keep going because you're going to have to do the same thing for the whole book. And while you're doing it, just do it. You know what I mean? It has three parts and I'll explain it to you. That's half your grade. Now how do we grade these? I've been doing this, Bonnie and I, this is our fifth time here. We've been coming here for eight years. When we first came here, the dining hall was that tent out there and it blew away one time. I mean, it was, and it was, you really ate fast out there. It was freezing cold. The wind was blowing, it was flapping like this. It was really something. Um, and, and lots of other things. And Sam, your twin brother, was everywhere, digging and doing plumbing and Sam, Weg Wegner. Uh, it was a blessing. How do we grade this? Uh, it's pass or fail. Either you do it or you don't. And that's how I get to see what kind of character you have. Because I get to read all these. By the way, you have to send me a copy. You, give, you turn it in like you normally do, but you send me a copy. That's why my email address, I keep showing it to you. So I need to get your devotionals, each one of you, and you know what I see? There's two types of students. The ones that do the bare minimum. And they do as little as possible. And they try and figure out the rules, and as soon as they figure it out, they do as little as possible. You know what? You get the same grade from me for just squeaking by and doing the bare minimum. Some of them write a commentary <laughs> like this. And I think, boy, if you got time to do it, good for you. And then most people are in the middle because all of a sudden you discover if you do this correctly, you're doing something that will help you the rest of your life. Because what you're doing is you're taking a chapter of the Bible and you're summarizing it, you're finding the lessons, the truth that's in there, and then you're applying it to your own life. And that is really what you should do for every chapter of the Bible. For the rest of your life, you should be in a journey to find something out of every chapter of Leviticus. Oh, that's a challenge. <laughs> out of every chapter of Ecclesiastes, out of every chapter of every book, First Chronicles. Because every word of God is pure. Every word of God is able to transform us. And so I'm just giving you the privilege to start in one of the most exciting books in the Bible and to do this. And I'll show you more in a minute. You learn two verses, they're each worth five points. You know, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, you all know that one. And if any man will open, I will come in and sup with him. That's the great invitation for devotions from Christ. That's 320. 2015 is the knockout verse, you know. I saw the dead, small and great stand before God and the books were open and, and the dead were judged out of the books and whoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast in a lake of fire. Wow. You learn those two. There are two quizzes. Uh, the first quiz, I think, is tomorrow. Uh, wow. And so uh, you better start studying uh, whatever's on it. You better learn it. And then there's one exam. Look how many points the exam is. But all the quizzes and all the exams are around the same thing. The seven churches, knowing them in order, knowing them, the names of them, Ephesus, do you all know them? Let's say them. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, you don't know this? Sardis, Philadelphia, yeah, I mean, Javaris. Javaris knows them, and Laodicea. 
So you got to know those. The second thing you have to know is the outline of the, the whole book of Revelation, which I'll show you in a minute. So there you go. All that's in your syllabus. You have it. How do you do this project? Uh, what I suggest is you invest time using a method called the devotional uh, method of Bible study. Now, Rick Warren, you ever heard of Rick Warren, you know, the Saddleback Church guy? His very first book he ever wrote, Before Purpose Driven Life, that's his most famous book that sold 40 million copies. His first book was called 12 Methods of Bible Study. And he said there are 12 different ways you study the Bible. He said the simplest one, the lifelong one, is the devotional one. And that's where you reduce every chapter to three points. You read it, then you summarize it, uh, and find any lessons, truths, or doctrines that you can find. I mean, this is for you, and you find them. And then you write out a prayer from you to the Lord, asking him to change you or to work in you or to impact your life. See, most people read the Bible and say, this will really help and they think of you know, their sister or their best friend or their child or their wife. Most of us don't read the Bible to, like a mirror and look in the mirror and say, ooh, I need to change that, ooh, oh, you know, wow, oh. You know, you look in the mirror, you're not looking through it at someone else, you're looking at yourself. And the Bible is a mirror. And it shows us actually Jesus Christ and we see ourselves compared to him and immediately say, I don't like the way I am, I want to be like you. So change this part of me. See, that's the whole purpose of Bible study. Okay, how do we do that real quickly? Um, oh, this is a page out of my Bible. And see, the way I do it is I actually mark all these things in the Bible as I find them. Like, uh, I wrote the majesty of God and we're all temporary and God's word is eternal and uh, uh, I can hardly read my own writing. God is above the universe. Uh, we should be recharged. Uh, those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Uh, I can't even read that one up there, but I could read it in my Bible, but that's not a very good picture. But basically, I f read the chapter, find those truths, and then reduce it to paper. Uh, the summary Isaiah 40, that's what you saw. Uh, this chapter covers John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ. Behold, a voice crying in the wilderness. You all know that. It's a promise about God's word. Remember, it says that the word of God, uh, grass withers, flower falls away, but the word of God stays forever. And then it ends, Isaiah 40 ends with that famous, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You all know that verse, right? They will mount up with wings like eagles. So that's just... A simple summary. Then uh, here are the lessons. Um, Jesus revealed the glory of God. All humans are transient. By the way, God knew the earth was round. He said that 2,700 years ago. Wow. You know, that's the most common comment on YouTube. Uh, I, we've had, let's see, 180 million minutes of videos watched by over, I think, a million and a half people. You know what the number one comment is? I thought the earth was flat. Can you believe people believe the earth is flat? Even though God says the earth turns like clay to a seal, like, like a roll of paper towel. The earth is rotating on an axis, God said. That's how they used to sign things. They would hold like a rolling pin and they'd go and they'd sign their name in clay like that and and the clay would turn to the seal on this axis they would go like a rolling pin god says the earth rotates it's not flat it's rotating on an axis and it says god sits above the circle of the earth in isaiah right there amazing and it says god wants me to meditate on his power and he wants me to follow him so my personal application so those are three parts, summary, da -da -da, lessons, application, O oh Lord, today, I will pause and reflect on your majesty. Did you know life changes when you do that? Most people are, they're looking down at this little fluff, you know, dust floating around the ground, and they live their whole life seeing their life all in turmoil and wondering what's going on. And God says, will you just stop for a second and go like this and look up here at me? 
I'm waiting to help you. I want you to pause and reflect on my majesty. And because I trust your plan is so much better than mine, I ask for you, dear Lord, to control and lead me. Finally, I want to wait on you right now and by faith feel I'm going to go forward with your strength. So that was my prayer. And that's all you have to do. Okay, now, when is this class over? 10 till? Is it on 50? All of them? It's a 50 minute class. Okay, oh boy. We have 14 slides to cover in 14 minutes. So if I go more than a minute, some of you start coughing or something. If I talk too long on one slide. Okay, here we go. Why is Revelation vital? Because this book, God gives us the most complete answers to the most important questions in life. What are the most important questions? Uh, origin. Did you know everybody wants to know where did I come from? How did I get here? Purpose. Why am I here? You know, am I just a primordial blob that, that evolved from a primordial sea or what? And where am I headed? You know, in Japan, how many Japanese do we have? Three. Three. There was an article in the American paper, I don't know if it's true, about Japan, but they said that, that what's killing an awful lot of young people in Japan is suicide. And they, they talked about one interesting way they commit suicide in Japan. They call it hibachi parties. And they, they take their parents' big Lexus 735i or whatever, and they get a little grill, and the four of them go out and sit somewhere to watch sunset, and they fire up the grill inside the Lexus, which is perfectly airtight, and they grill their food in the car and eat it. And as they're watching the sunset, eating the food, that has consumed all the oxygen. And when you don't have oxygen, you start getting sleepy. It's called carbon monoxide poisoning. And they all fall asleep together. And the police in the New York Times said that they call these, these group suicides hibachi parties. Because they don't know how they got here. They don't know why they're there. They see their parents. Their parents have worked for the same company for their entire lifetime. They make more money every year of their life. What for? They're still living this little tiny, very restricted life. And they go, why am I here? and I don't know where I'm going. So why don't I just get there now and they have a bocce party. See, this is the world that we live in that is hopeless and has no purpose. So Revelation reveals that God the Son is the creator. That's chapter 14, we're gonna cover that. It's amazing how the, the book of Revelation connects everything. Revelation 5 says God the Son is the redeemer and Revelation 20 that you're memorizing the verse God the Son is the judge. So our origin is through the Creator, Jesus Christ. Our purpose is we were bought at a price, redeemed, and our destiny is we're going to stand and give an account. So basically that outlines the whole Bible. Did you know Genesis 1 and 2 introduce the Creator? Genesis 3 through Revelation 5 display Him as the Redeemer, and Revelation 6 to 22 shows Him as the judge. And basically what we have to tell people is, are you going to face the truth now or later? You see, everyone that's ever lived, everyone, from Hitler to Genghis Khan to Emperor Hirohito to every American president are all going to stand in front of that great white throne of Revelation 20. And everything they've ever done, God's kept track of. And he's going to judge every human based on every sin they ever committed. Except for us. Because there's no record of our sins. Did you know that? God will never point his finger at me and say, why did you do that? Why did you think that? Why did you say that? Why did you hurt that person? The Bible says Jesus Christ on the cross was punished like he committed every sin that I've ever committed. That's what justification is. That God already punished Jesus for all my sins. Already punished Jesus for my sins. And when he did that, he took the record of my sins off of me that I committed them, and he put them on Christ. Boy, that's the greatest doctrine in the Bible. When unsaved people hear that, they don't believe it. For many years I was a pastor and, and like most pastors, there are people that come around that are poor. In America they're called shopping cart people. 
they, they steal the shopping cart from Walmart and they push it around and that's their house. And they keep all their stuff in there and they have bags hanging off of it and everything they own, they, have all, they decorate them and they push them around and they would push them up to our church and park in the front and come in and ask for what? Food and money. And they're shopping cart people, they're homeless people. There are millions of them in America, all over the place. And so they'd come up and we had a rule we all rotated through all the pastors that we would share the gospel with them. And then we would give them food. We wouldn't give them money because what would they spend the money on, most of them? Alcohol, yeah, and just get worse. So we'd get them food. Or we'd take them to the mission, you know, where they'd get a good shower, a good meal, clean bed, park their cart, you know, and rest a little bit. So, and I'll still remember one of them. He was six feet eight. Now, none of you are old enough to remember the great f American football player named Refrigerator Perry was his name. He was as big as a refrigerator. He really was. He was a lineman. He was unbelievably big. This guy was a reincarnation of Refrigerator Perry. He was mm, just massive. So he came in, and I wasn't on duty that day. My assistant was, and he went to him, and he says, could I share something with you? The guy says, hey, I got all day. You know, I mean, he just laid back in the, he liked being in the church, it was warm. He laid back, and this pastor shared the doctrine of justification. And he said, did you know God treated Jesus Christ like he committed every sin? And the guy sat up, and he looked at the pastor, he says, what? And he said, if you'll call out to Jesus Christ right now, God will put every sin you've ever committed on Christ and will have treated Christ like he committed all the sins. That man said, that's not true. He said, I am a boozer. Now that's an English word for an alcoholic. He said, I'm a boozer. And this pastor said, well, if you'll call the name of the Lord, God will treat Jesus Christ like he was a boozer. And he said, no. He said, I don't believe that. So he showed him in the Bible, that 2 Corinthians 5.21 which says this. This is the greatest verse, by the way, in the Bible. If there's one verse that's the greatest verse in the whole Bible, it's right here. And it says, For God hath made him who knew no sin to become sin. So God made Christ to become sin. That we become the righteousness of God in him. So we become Christ's righteousness and Christ becomes our sin. And so Refrigerator Perry is sitting there and he goes, well, that's not all I am. Now it's confession time. I mean, it was really funny to hear this. He said, I'm a womanizer. I thought you and your shopping cart are a womanizer? What woman would have anything to do with you? you know? I mean, you could smell him. He smelled like a doghouse. Have you ever smelled a doghouse? It's, it was awful. I mean, this guy never took a bath. He lived underneath a bridge with his shopping cart. He said, I'm a womanizer. Well, you know what the gospel says? That God treats Christ like he did all of your sins. And that six foot eight, gigantic homeless man said, I want it. Well, the pastor thought he wanted the food and the gas card, so he said, okay, I'll go get it for you. And he went back and got him the food and the, the tickets to go to the mission. He said, no, no, I want that. He said, no, I don't want that. He said, I want that. He said, what do you want? He says, I want Jesus to become, he says, that's the best thing I've ever heard of. Did you know he was really listening? He understood the gospel. He understood Christ died in his place. And that gigantic man, fell on his knees and asked the Lord to save him. Do you know what? He completely changed. He went to the mission, took a shower, got rid of his cart, got a job. He started showing up at church. You know how he knew he was there? He would put 10% of how much he earned at his job in a little piece of paper, like a grocery bag or something. He'd, he'd tear a piece and he'd put in $1.23 and he'd twist it all up and he'd drop it in the offering. The next week he'd put in $2.51. It was always 10% of whatever his check or his income was that week. About a month later he said he saw a baptism 
We did, we did baptisms where people stand in front in the baptistry and share how they got saved with a microphone explaining to everybody how they were born again. He said, I want that, I want that. He said, I'm saved. Can you imagine this monster, tall, huge guy <laughs> and me? And he said, he said, I'm gonna give my testimony. I said, okay, so he pulled that microphone and just talked so loudly in it. He said, God treated Jesus like he was a boozer. And everybody in that church were so conservative and they all went like this, you know, because he was so loud and so big. And he said, and that's what I was, but now God treated Jesus like he was. And he says, and God treated Jesus like he's a womanizer. And he just was, I mean, as only he could have done. And it really shocked the people to realize the gospel that we can share with people is amazing. No one, you guys didn't hum, I went more than a minute. Uh, doesn't the Bible sometimes seem like a, a 31,000 piece puzzle that you can't put together until you see the cover? Revelation is the cover. It explains it all. Revelation connects and completes the whole Bible. In fact, the only way to understand all of Isaiah's prophecies about Israel's future is to see it in the context of Revelation, for example. What I tell people is this. Every verse of the Bible has the weight of all the other 31,000 verses pressing on it. You really can't understand the Bible without what the reformers used to talk about. You know, the reformers, you know, the Re Reformation. They talked about the analogia scriptura, which is in Latin. Now that I took. Remember, I didn't take typing, I took Latin. What really helped me in my whole life, you know. But what this means is that the best way to understand the Bible is to see what else the Bible says about itself, the analog Analogia Scriptura. So basically, it only takes 72 hours to read the whole Bible. Now this is the first one I'm gonna tell you is on your, this is on every quiz and test. So some of you need to wake up and you need to grab that, okay? How long does it take to read the whole Bible? That's for a sixth grader to read it out loud. Do you understand that? If a sixth grader was given a Bible and they went like this, in them he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run the race. It takes 72 hours to read the Bible. How long does it take to watch one soccer game, the whole thing? How long? Three hours. How long does a football game take with all the commercials? Four or five hours. How long does it take to play your favorite video game? How long? Some of you never finish it. It like takes all your time. You know what I mean? How about watching all your favorite stuff? How about, how much time do most young people your age spend on their cell phones? Unbelievable amounts. This phone is touched a couple thousand times a day by most people. That's how much it is. Did you know if you devote some of that time, it only takes 72 hours to read the whole Bible. You'll see that on every quiz and every test, and I'll ask you over and over again. Now, the, the book of Revelation, John the Apostle is the author. He wrote five books. Do you all know which five? He wrote the Gospel by, yep, and first, and second, and third, John. that's right, and he wrote the book of, so he wrote five books. Uh, the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ was written to reveal Jesus Christ. That's why it's called Revelation, it's to reveal him. The theme of this book is also the title, The Unveiling of Christ. It's a self-outlined book, I'm gonna show you that. It's a very challenging book, and it's the only book that comes with a blessing. And the Bible says that if you read it, you'll be blessed. Now, the outline is right here. It's in verse 19. It's the vision of Christ on Patmos, the things which you've seen, the things which are, that's the seven churches, and the things which will be hereafter. So basically, this is one of those books that tells us in advance the outline of it. And this is the outline that you're gonna be, this is all the quizzes and the test. Christ's church on earth is Revelation 1 through 3. Christ's church in heaven is 4 and 5 and 19, 1 to 10. The tribulation in heaven and on earth is 6 to 18. The second coming is 19. 
The earthly millennial rule is chapter 20. The final rebellion and great white throne is the second half of chapter 20. And then dwelling in heaven is 21 and 22. Now this is what the test will say. I didn't write the test. They wrote it in New York. But it will say, as Jesus is describing his second coming in Revelation 18. Now look at that chart. Is that a true or false? Is Jesus returning in chapter 18? When does, what chapter does he return in from the chart? Oh, so it says, as Jesus is returning in Revelation 18, is that true or false? Do you see how hard this is? You actually have to know that outline so that in a sentence, if it says, as Jesus is writing to the churches in Revelation 6. Oh. He's writing to the churches in Revelation 1, 2, 3, the seven, actually the, the quiz question or the test question says, as Jesus wrote to the seven churches in Revelation 6. He didn't write to the seven churches. He wrote to them in Revelation 1 to 3. Do you understand why? Uh, they can really make things hard. Uh-oh, I'm going to win. There's no bell. I can keep talking endlessly. Okay, got to go. Hurry back, I'll be buzzing at 